This is Health and Society, a podcast series featuring early career researchers from the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at King's College London with interviewer Nigel Warburton. For further information and more podcasts, go to www.healthandsociety.co.uk. Hello, I'm Nigel Warburton. Joining me today is Lawrence Sacco, an ESRC-sponsored PhD candidate in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at King's College London. The topic we're going to focus on is ageing populations. Lawrence, perhaps you could just begin by saying what's happening in the world in terms of the ageing populations. Over the world, uh, this is a global phenomenon. The population is becoming older, and uh, in particular, the proportion of older people is increasing throughout the world. It's now 8% of the population is over the age of 65, but uh, in uh, 2050, this will uh, double to 16%. So what you're saying is that in the total population of the world, We're going to get to a stage quite soon where 16% of the people alive will be over 65. Yes, and actually if you will look at single countries, especially in Europe or Japan, this proportion is actually even higher. In countries like uh, Italy and Spain and Japan, we're expecting the proportion of people over 65 to go over 30%. So, just to get clear now, Roughly, what's the percentage of people over 65 in the UK? That's interesting because the uh, population ageing in the UK is actually not as a large phenomenon as in southern European countries or Japan, where fertility is much lower. So in the UK, there are 18% of the population currently over the age of 65. And this is not projected to go beyond 30%, like in countries where population ageing is instead much more pronounced. So you've already suggested that the UK is different from a number of other countries. Why are we getting these fluctuations between countries in terms of ageing population? Firstly, because population ageing is not only determined by longevity, but also by fertility. So in countries where the fertility is very low, much lower than uh, replacement fertility, like Italy, Spain, a lot of Eastern European countries, Japan, population ageing proportionally is much more pronounced. Then if we look also at uh, lower and middle income countries, because we often think that population is only an issue for rich countries, uh, actually we see that uh, population ageing is going to affect also lower and middle income countries, where there have been uh, much faster demographic changes, in particular the decrease of mortality and also the decrease of fertility. For example, much of the increase uh, of uh, older people globally will be concentrated in countries like China, India, where the absolute number of older people is going to treble or even more. And this includes also countries like Pakistan or Bangladesh, which we think usually as uh, very young countries, which they are proportionally. But then if we look at the number of people over the age of 65, there is a massive increase. Why are we getting such a dramatic increase in the number of older people in a country like China? The reason that underlies population ageing is this historical change that has happened in most countries in the world but at different paces. And this is the demographic transition, which is a transition from a high mortality, high fertility society to a low mortality, low fertility one. In historical Europe, for example, this has happened very slowly over a long period of time. But in countries like China, this has happened really fast, where more Mortality decreased really fast for infants, but also fertility has decreased massively in a very short period of time. So this is causing two different demographic changes at the same time. While China's population, for example, expanded a lot, at the same time fertility decreased a lot. So all this uh, large number of people that were born uh, 30, 40 years ago now are becoming older. This is also the case not just for China but also for Bangladesh. It was also partly the case for Japan where fertility decreased really fast after World War II. I can see with China as well, 
the single child policy introduced by the state must have had some influence on the kind of fertility levels that were around in that country. Yeah, that's true. Even though per the China's fertility was decreasing already before the one-child policy, but definitely the one-child policy had a role in uh, keeping fertility low. An increasing number of older people is usually seen as a bad thing for a country. That Obviously, if most of the people who are in employment are younger people, you have an increasing number of people who are perhaps dependent on the state, dependent on health services, and a smaller group of people able to work on a daily basis. So is that an accurate picture? Is, is this something we should be concerned about? Well, firstly, we should uh, recognize, having talked about all these demographic facts, that uh, population aging is something we should celebrate, because it shows our great human achievements in, uh, firstly, living longer, decreasing mortality and all live longer lives and improving health. And also it shows our great achievement in controlling fertility at a population level. And also regarding all, uh, of course, the challenges that this uh, impressive phenomenon causes, they're often overplayed and maybe we don't focus on the positive. So, but regarding employment, for example, we often focus on the fact that the proportion of people over the age of 65 is increasing compared to the people uh, who are aged from 15 to 65. And the people often talk about the dependency ratio, they call this dependency, which it's actually very mi misleading because, first of all, not all, all uh, people over the age of 65 are dependent. A lot of them actually are working and or they're doing a lot of productive uh, activities like informal care, volunteering. And then also we should also think about unemployment. Not everybody in the age range from 15 to 65 is working. A lot of them are unemployed and there is also a lot of diversity in the levels of employment over the age of 65 between different countries. For instance, the levels of employment are much higher in Japan, where there is much better health at uh, older ages. I suppose focusing on employment runs the risk of failing to recognise that older people can make huge contributions to society outside of employment, outside of formal paid employment. Yes, that's uh, right, because especially in the UK, from the census data, people over the age of 50 are actually, there is a much higher proportion providing informal care, which also from the point of view of economic contribution is really important. The cost of informal care in the UK has been evaluated as being higher than the NHS. There is also volunteering. A lot of people, even uh, at older ages, uh, do a lot of volunteering activities. And this is important both for individuals, because it gives a role, a sense of purpose, and also for society, of course, from an economical point of view. So are we suffering from a misleading picture of the consequences of an ageing population? Not entirely, because there are also challenges, of course, for an ageing population. For example, in health, we should think, are we living longer lives, but are we also living better lives? And demographers often talk about the compression of morbidity. So whether, as well as uh, living longer, the period where we live with uh, diseases or illnesses or disabilities, whether that is increasing. And uh, some studies are showing that actually that might be occurring in some samples, in some populations, but there is also some uh, evidence against that. And a lot of this variation is du due to a number of reasons. First of all, different countries. In some countries this might be occurring, this might not. Some, some countries maybe they're living longer, but they're not living better lives because of health and social care at older ages. But also an important issue is inequalities. For example, there are huge inequalities which are often documented for life expectancy, but also there are huge inequalities, times even larger for healthy life expectancy. And uh, in the UK, that is also true. Generally, the picture that we get of old age is of physical decline, mental decline, gradual removal from society in many ways. Is there a positive picture around? Is there a better way of thinking about old age? 
I think there should be because probably we there is a lot of focus on population aging as a challenge and there hasn't been enough thinking about this actually for what could what the positives could be and actually one of my favorite thoughts doesn't come from uh, demography or epidemiology but comes from an historian his name is Theodore Rozak he is famous for writing how to make a counterculture and this is a book that defined the 60s and uh, especially in the North America, the baby boomers. But then 30 years later he wrote how to make an elder culture and he makes some bold statements but I think they are actually uh, maybe very utopian but a nice thinking of how an elder culture could bring some improvements to society. For example, he argues that uh, the boomers will actually bring social change in their older age. For example, as uh, older people are going to fight for entitlements, entitlements for pension, as uh, there is a lot of uh, argument for increasing pension age or removing welfare that they actually might help to extend those entitlements. In his case, which is the United States of America, also talks about extending healthcare service throughout the population or giving entitlements that are typical of old age to everybody. And then there is also a more uh, so social argument that he says an elder culture is actually going to be more humane, more focused on compassion. We've thought, I've mentioned informal care and, for example, he says that with uh, a larger proportion of older people, we'll have more people uh, available to provide care. And also that this is actually going to contrast uh, a lot of the stereotype of the alpha male, for example, as people have to recognize their physical limitation, they're actually going to be more able to ask for help. And so he envisions a society based on help and care and compassion, which I think it can sound very utopian, but it's also very interesting and exciting. Lauren Sacco, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Health and Society. This podcast series is sponsored by the Educational Fund and produced by Aidan Judd and Ellie Clifford. For further information and more podcasts, go to www.healthandsociety.co.uk.